Hello everybody and welcome to the channel. Today on Brewmasters we're talking to the King of Warlocks, Mr. William King, the creator of Genuine Fantasy Press and the Compendium of Forgotten Secrets. With all the warlocks you will ever need in your life, hopefully. Absolutely. Now let's uh, start with the basics and get to know you a little. So what was your first role-playing experience? So if you really want to get into it, uh, way back in the day there was a fantastic game called Neverwinter Nights. And that was the thing that got me hooked on the idea of Dungeons and Dragons. And when I realized that, like, hey, there's more to this than actually just a, uh, like, classic Baldur's Gate style game. And you, know, you can actually play this with real people and friends and stuff. I was like, hey, this is cool. And so in uh, junior high, high school, I started playing some of that. It was a grand time. I started on, like, 3.5 and Pathfinder. And when 5th edition came out, I pretty much switched over just about immediately because I realized that like it does a lot of things that I really like. And so here we are. Nice. So you mentioned Pathfinder there. Uh, do you have experience with mini RPGs outside of Dungeons and Dragons or do you just like to stick to 5e? Uh, let's see. I have run several games of Call of Cthulhu, though it's mostly just little quick kind of one shot sorts of things where we play Gaslight Your Friends with how weird this is, and that's always entertaining. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Yeah, it's it's a good time. And then I've played a bit of Talislanta back when that was a thing. Um, that, was a, that was a really eye-opening experience for me, seeing what a RPG that is designed to have be really fleshed out in terms of world-building and it fills in all the gaps and every single possible thing that you could want is in it. But I realized at the same time that when you do something like that, it becomes extremely difficult to tell your own stories if you're not the people who are the ones who created it in the first place, because there's not a whole lot of space to start interacting with the world because the world's already so made, if that makes sense. Yeah, I've had that kind of experience with TV or movie based games where the content relies heavily on what you see in the show, but the writers obviously won't expand beyond that for fear of fan backlash, that kind of thing. Exactly. So it makes sense then that you might want to get started with creating your own content. Speaking of which, how did you get started with Homebrew? Was that part of your motivation? Oh, well, so uh, fifth edition came out and I was like, hey, this is cool. And then I was like, eh. And so I decided that I was going to make my own role-playing game system, which of course is the absolute like recipe for disaster, going from zero experience to trying to do a full thing. And so I tried to make one. It was called Quadruvia, and it was like based on the four attributes, and you had like this weird little flow chart that would let you pick all of your class features and everything, but there weren't classes, but there were, and it was very dysfunctional. Amusing. A good creative exercise, but like the, the end result was completely unplayable. But I realized that like, okay, that's too far. Maybe I need to tone back a bit. And so then I started to go back to fifth edition because I was like, hey, I really like this. I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with it for a little bit more. And I decided to make a full class, which was like, hey, you know, 3.5 had a cool thing called the soul knife that's really cool they make they make weapons with their minds that's fun i'm gonna make that i'm gonna make that in fifth edition and it was a it was a it was a complete disaster <laughs> but i learned a lot because I'm, I'm just gonna tell you anybody who wants to start pumbering do not try and do a full class the first thing you do also do try and do a full class the first thing you do because if you stick with it and you're willing to admit how horrible it is the whole time and you'll learn pretty much everything you need to know about the system because what you're going to make is going to in interact with everything. Absolutely. Uh, making a class is maybe one of the most challenging things you can attempt, um, even for the most experienced of us, I think. Uh, but yeah, if you give it a try, you're definitely going to learn a lot. Uh, you're going to see how it interacts with all the game systems, and that can be really educational. Now, um, you never seem to have trouble coming up with ideas for new content, but where do you get your inspiration from? So a lot of it is choosing specific themes. A lot of it is art and music. I think that one of the most, not necessarily poetic, but 
like from a creative perspective, one of the most practical things that you can do as a creative person or someone who is engaged in any any sort of activity that requires you to make something new is to look at stuff that's already been done and find cool things you like. Uh, one, one mistake that I see some people make when they're trying to do creative stuff is that they'll like they'll say, I'm not going to look at anybody else's stuff because I don't want to be influenced by it. No, <laughs> the goal is to show what you like, because there are few things more beautiful to humans than the passion and work of other humans. That's just a thing that we do. And so when you can go and find art and music and literature that you like and games, every single kind of media that has been made by people, and you can look at that and say, I really like this particular element. I really like this style of writing. I really like this cool ability that this character is using. I really like this cool plot thing where this set of stuff happens and it turns out like this. And then you take all those things and you say, these are the things that I personally like about whatever it is that we're talking about. And then I'm going to mix them together into a new fashion and say, these are the really cool elements that I think are great. Put them into a thing, show it to the world. People will like that because if you think it's cool, somebody else is also probably going to think it's cool. If you don't think it's cool, then it's not going to be that cool. Yeah. I mean, uh, you based the eternal Citadel on a picture of a castle. Is that right? Yeah, it was, it was a glorious image, I will admit. And it was one of those um, magic cards that never got used or printed, but the art was just absolutely too good. And so I'm sitting there looking at it. And I'm like, this is awesome. There, I don't, I don't know what the story is here. I don't have any clue. It, it was never made into anything, so there is no story behind it. And I just wanted to have that be the focal point of something incredible. And so, when you start with that kind of like passionate appreciation of something, you're able to draw upon the elements of that that you'll enjoy. And if you like it, then everyone else will like it. <laughs> so then how would you go about actualizing your ideas? Like taking something you have a concept for and then actually turning that into like rules and mechanics for the game that you're working with. Once you found something that you really like, the first key is to understand what you want to do with it. Um, if you're going to do something kind of quick and simple, like make a magical item, that's probably the easiest thing to do in fifth edition, for, for example, is magic items. You look at the thing, you say, this looks cool, or this this is what I want to make. How am I going to make it? Um, understanding the rule set is obviously incredibly important. Understanding the proper wording and phrasing. A lot of my advice would be just read the player's handbook, read the player's handbook again read the other various works that they put out like Xanathar's guide and the other content and look at how the actual content is normally written. Once you kind of get a feeling for how the content is normally written and you can use the same kinds of words and the same kinds of phrases, make sure that you have your capitalization the same as they do. Make sure you have all of the key words in there like advantages and disadvantages and, and that kind of thing. And once you start to understand the system and you're familiar with it and comfortable with it, it becomes a lot easier to look at something and figure out how to turn what's in your head into reality. Um, I would seriously suggest trying to keep things simple. A lot of times what I'll see new creators do is they want to mimic something perfectly and like i was mentioning earlier with the video games topic there are a lot of things that you just can't necessarily do with tabletop games there's going to be too much tracking there's going to be too many different little states or something to keep in mind and that becomes really difficult to manage when you're trying to work it in play so keep it simple what's the very simplest way that i can achieve this result What's it going to look like? What's it going to do? Write that. If all of it needs to do is deal damage, just have it deal damage. 
If all it needs to do is let you move more quickly, just have it do that. There's usually a really simple way to convey a concept, and you can use flavor text. You can just right at the beginning, you can say, this lets you cut through space and time. And people will go, oh, I can kind of visualize that. I've seen enough of other media to know what cutting through space and time kind of looks like. And so now, when you give me this sword that lets me do that, I know what I'm expecting. And it works. It gives you something that you can kind of interact with in a really straightforward, clear way. Yeah. I mean, you really can't overstate how important it is for your work to look like it belongs in the player's handbook. Uh, using similar formatting and fonts, it really just hits you on like this subconscious level, I think. Exactly. Yes, if you can if you can make it look right, that's half the battle. The other half of the battle is making sure that it's balanced appropriately for what you're trying to create. And that is as much an art as it is a science. And really, my only suggestion is take as much feedback as you can from as many people as you can and from as many reliable and unreliable sources as you can. Because sometimes people don't know what they're talking about, but they're still going to give you what their impression is. And their impression is really important. Because if you're trying to make something for public consumption and the first reaction that everyone has to it is, oh, this is too strong or, oh, this is really weak. Why would I ever want this? Then they're not going to take a further look at it to understand and appreciate what you've made, even if it is done well and actually functions properly the way you want it to and will be suitable for their game. It's as much about appearance as it is about reality. There's some ways that you could make stuff that looks like it's completely fine and it's actually just absurd. But for the most part, it's going to be the other way around. Exactly. Even the uninformed opinions are coming from what is most likely your target audience, right? I mean, you should try and scour that information for any grains of wisdom hidden in there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So on the subject of feedback, what advice would you give for brewers who are interested in trying to balance their work or just on the subject of balance in general? Well, I will definitely say keep your, keep your hopes kind of contained when, you're, when you start out. Um, a lot of times you'll write something and people will say that it's too strong or it's too weak. I'm personally the kind of person who likes to start things too strong and tone them back down because it's a, it's a lot easier to do that in my experience than it is to make something weak that isn't necessarily going to like do all the things you want it to do and then like add things on top that are going to somehow flesh it out but you can give something the the appearance of being really powerful and effective in doing what you want it to do and then adding limitations adding restrictions adding um just all the little things that will make it work properly after the fact. At the same time, you're going to want to make sure that people are actually willing to give it the time of day. So try not to go too far out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good advice, actually. A lot of people will go out of their way to shout about anything that's overpowered, but underpowered stuff absolutely goes under the radar. So it's a good tip. One of the things that I like kind of said that I ought to do, but I haven't actually done is deliberately making one or two things in each preview that I push out, like stronger than they should be in like a noticeable way, just so that I'm going to get some engagement and feedback on those points. Because if someone's going to be willing to give engagement and feedback on that point, they're probably going to give the rest of it a look over and kind of talk through what things they do and don't like and what the really good feedback that you're actually looking for. Because I will admit, as a creator, it can be frustrating when you put a lot of time into something and you make something you think is really good, but because it's not sufficiently controversial in some way, it doesn't necessarily get a whole lot of engagement. And so you don't get a lot of views or a lot of feedback overall, despite it being good and sound. Makes sense. I mean, it can be difficult to get feedback in any of the publishing arenas, DMs Guild especially, although... I'll admit that I'm not very good at leaving feedback for anything I've bought either. <laughs> yeah, that's that's definitely a difficult thing. 
Um, I I kind of am amazed by the people who are willing to go straight to DMs go with their content in a couple of ways, primarily because it's it's in, really difficult to get feedback on non-public or not necessarily non-public platforms, but platforms that are not built as social media. And so that's the kind of thing that I would, I would really recommend that if you listener or someone who's thinking of starting in Humber, make sure that you either get yourself a good community that you can use prior to any kind of release or publishing, or you find a way to release things for free in the public view and then move to a commercial platform. Um, there are a couple of ways to do this. DMs Guild is one. It's probably the easiest and most popular. Um, you can use the open game license as a solid alternative if you don't want to uh, use DMs Guild. There are notable advantages to each. And so it's one of those things where you really need to kind of make a decision about what sort of thing that you're wanting out of your brewing. Interesting. Well, I mean, I'm definitely curious to hear more of your thoughts on DMs Guild and its place as part of the fifth edition world. Personally, it, it has its pros and it has its cons. I don't use it because I value my intellectual property and I like being able to do my free previews, free distribution elsewhere. That's how I was able to manage to build my audience and do the sales that I have is because I can give away all of the mechanical content in my book for free, literally everywhere, and not have to worry about it. And so then people go, hey, I want to support you. I'm going to buy the hardcover. I'm going to buy the full digital version. And I can go, hey, great, fantastic. And all of that goes to me. With DM Guild, you get a lot of notable advantages. For one, it's way easier to put something up on there and have it like be able to be profitable for you because if you're not investing in art or investing in a whole lot of um, other people's engagement or spending money on layouts and that kind of thing, you can immediately just write something up, put it on there. There you go. Um, on the downside, it is not sometimes harder, harder to build a following. If you're just starting there, uh, you don't necessarily have control over the intellectual property. And so if you put something on there, it's on there forever. and You can't really put it anywhere else. And at the same time, you are not going to be able to receive the full value of any sales that you get or anything like that. So it's, it's a mixed bag. There's pros and there's cons. And I am definitely not the person who's going to lean into it. But I think for a lot of people, it really works. For example, if you want to use Wizards of the Coast intellectual property, if you want to write something for Ravnica, if you want to write stuff for the Forgotten Realms or use any of their characters or a lot of their spells and that kind of thing, then DM Skilled is definitely the only way to go. And it's fantastic for that. If you're writing companion guides to the officially published adventures, DM Skilled is, is your, is your go-to method. Yeah. And the 50% take on everything that you sell is a bit harsh. It definitely is. Yeah. I mean, I think at best, it's maybe a good tool for first timers, people who aren't experienced with, say, setting up a website or monetization systems and stuff like that. Yeah, it, it, it does do all that for you. Though, if you want to stick with the open game license, um, open or uh, the same people who are responsible for DMs Guild, which is one bookshelf or open bookshelf, I believe, mm -hmm. they also have a like just general tabletop games, and you can sell your stuff there as well. So it kind of comes down to what you want to do. They do take a cut, but it'll allow you to publish things that you normally wouldn't be able to, like new campaign settings or new... Um, there's there's several things that Wizards doesn't let you put on DM skill, which is kind of interesting. But for the most part, it really is a uh, call between two. Well, I mean, I've seen people using Patreon these days. Do you think that's a viable alternative? 
It really depends on what you're trying to do. Um, personally, I think the one individual who I've seen do fifth edition content really, really successfully on Patreon is um, Griff Mac, the Griffin Saddlebag guy. He is an artist. Uh, I would, I would almost say first and foremost, but he makes uh, magical items and characters and he associates with other creators to do um, like little short adventures and that kind of thing. And his, his work is excellent. He does a very good job with it, but he is his, his thing is that he releases a new magical item with new artwork pretty much every day. And so when you have that kind of persistent stream of content, you can, very easily and effectively attract a patron crowd because you're able to provide something that is quick. It's easy. People can use it. People like it. And the result kind of speaks for itself. It doesn't need any additional context. And so since it's short, small things that people really like and people are immediately going to use, you'll be able to um, kind of have that consistency in production. Whereas if you're the kind of person who wants to make larger pieces of content or is making something that's going to require a lot more community feedback over a longer period of time, it might not necessarily be the route you want to go. It really just kind of depends on what sort of creator you are, what you're looking to do, and whether or not you're able to make the platform work for you. Okay. So... What if you just want to share your work to the masses and you aren't necessarily interested in monetization? Uh, what would you say is the best platform for that? Just sharing to the masses? I would say Reddit is the way to go. Unearthed Arcana is a fantastic subreddit. I believe there's a couple of others that do a pretty decent job. And you'll get eyes on your work. You'll be able to get feedback. Might not always be the best feedback, but it will be people who are genuinely interested in what you've written and are passionate about humbering in general. The other thing you can do is go on Discord. You can join my Discord. I have one. You can probably find a link to it somewhere. You have the uh, Discord of Many Things, which is the Unearthed Arcana's uh, Discord. And there's several other creator Discords that you can find. It's a really good way to get quick feedback. It's a really good way to... Um, work on small individual things at a time rather than like, hey, here's my whole subclass, look at it. If you can say, I want to know about this particular feature or I want to know about this particular magic item or I want to know about this particular spell and just kind of go through and really get into the core conceptions of how good mechanics are written in 5th edition and what kinds of things people take as like gospel and people will think is not right at all and it's a good way to get into that kind of deal yeah i mean i can agree with that and i can attest to a number of positive experiences with the discords and reddits out there your discord is always reliable and of course we met on the discord of many things the official discord of the unearthed arcana reddit yeah it's it's a good place i would definitely recommend checking it out at first i thought like oh lead to snobs at one point and then i actually went there after i had pushed out uh, Forgotten Secrets the second time, and I was like, oh, these people actually know what they're talking about, and they're pretty nice. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So it feels like we've gotten to know you a bit better. Uh, now let's dive into the Compendium of Forgotten Secrets. Oh, yeah, sure. What would you like to ask? Well, for the benefit of those who aren't aware, uh, would you mind giving us a brief overview of what the Compendium is and maybe expand into uh, how the book came about? It originally started as a passion project. I was just like, hey, I'm going to make warlocks. And so I started making them. And I made uh, what ended up being a total of 17 warlock patrons and then 17 additional non-warlock subclasses for like a total of 34. And what I've done with them is specifically made it so that you can slot them into your world. Each individual patron can be used completely exclusively of any of the others. And you just say, oh, this is going to be here. And you put the Ashen Wolf in the fiery volcano region that you may have. Or you put the Accursed Archive just kind of floated off in space and just waiting to kind of come down and mess with people. Or you have 
the gelatinous convocation big happy slime cubes show up for whatever purpose you need them for. But they're not going to occupy any of your world or plot beyond what you want them to. And I think that that's something that I took away from like looking at how fleshed out Palazenta was, is that modular content is the future of game design, in my personal opinion. Oh, absolutely. Um, just how easy it is to slot the work right into your campaign setting. I think that's a huge selling point for a lot of DMs. Exactly. One of the things that I struggle with when I like, I understand a lot of people really love established settings and they can be really cool, but I personally struggle with them because I'm always wanting to make something my own or do something with it. And when it starts to conflict with some kind of established lore, I'm just like, eh, that doesn't really work. Or now I'm going to have to change this. And if I'm changing something like this, I'm going to have to start telling my players how much it's changed. And that requires a lot more effort and a lot more buy-in from all parties. And so when I make something, I want it to be able to fit nicely alongside everything else and have as little disruption as possible. Because the other stuff's already cool. Otherwise, you wouldn't be using it. Yeah, and that makes perfect sense. Um, so, I mean, in regards to the compendium, how did you get started putting it all together? Did you just begin with a couple of classes, or did you try and flesh out the whole thing at once? I made a warlock. I saw some really cool art that it inspired me, and I made the Shadow Cat as my first warlock patron. It wasn't very good when I first made it, but it was it was just this. Here's a cat. It looks cool. It's kind of dark. It's kind of spooky. And here you go. And I made that and it, it got it got a decent response. And I was like, OK, that's cool. I'm going to make another thing. And so I made the Ashen Wolf because I was like, well, I can't just have a cat because I'm a dog person. So here's a, here's a wolf dog creature. <laughs> so made the Ashen Wolf. It's a fiery wolf. It's hungry. Pretty straightforward, but has a lot of good flavor going with it. And the response was good there, too. And then I made another couple of patrons and eventually I got to what I think is the is the first crowning achievement of mine which was the eternal citadel to my knowledge nobody else has done a warlock patron that is a sentient location but it it was it was something that I felt was like really unique I saw I saw some absolutely beautiful artwork and I was like I have to make this a thing and so the eternal citadel was born and the entire idea is a sentient fortress that just kind of floats between the planes, um, taking people to places where they're supposed to go in order to preserve the worlds and preserve order. Its entire thing is preservation. That's why it's eternal. And so that really got a good response. I think that was the thing that kind of put me on the map is like, okay, this guy's doing something interesting. And I continued from there. I made the first edition of Forgotten Secrets. It was pretty good. People liked it, but it needed improvements. I made a second edition of Forgotten Secrets, and people really liked that. I added a whole bunch of new patrons, and it brought in the Accursed Archive for the first time, which I think is the one thing that everyone has really enjoyed. It's literally Forbidden Lore, the patron. And I think that speaks to a lot of people because the entire purpose of Warlock is forbidden lore the evil bad stuff that we're not really supposed to maybe make a deal with but you are anyway haha <laughs> absolutely so that was that was the thing and i continued to make more stuff after that i made the compendium of sacred mysteries which was focused on clerics it did okay i think the clerics are less popular than warlocks just in terms of like people liking homebrew but that's possibly because warlocks have fewer subclasses to begin with, and they're also the class of customization. So if you're the person who likes customizing stuff, then you're probably going to like Warlocks. Whereas Clerics are very um, unnecessarily straightforward, but they have, a, they have a particular kind of set series of metrics, and they usually have one particular theme rather than multiple themes like you can put with Warlocks. So I was a little different. And I did that, and then I... I tried to do druids, didn't succeed at druids when I first tried them because druids were not, in my mind, set up properly at the time when I was trying to work at them. So 
I came back to Warlocks and I decided that I was going to actually publish the Command of Forgotten Secrets as a full, real hardcover book and worked on that for about eight months. And then here we are, 2,500 sales later with <laughs> a successful release. That's very impressive. Congratulations. And I mean, it's interesting to hear all the backstory. I only learned about the compendium just before the Awakening update came out. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. The uh, the classic me with bad cover art. Ooh, that was a time. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that bad. <laughs> oh, that, that one was OK. There were previous ones where it was literally just, hey, you know, the images on the inside. Let's just make a collage. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> Uh, would you mind expanding on how the law for the All Risen came about? Oh, so um, when I decided to go to the full book edition and actually like have it be a real publication, I decided that I needed something to call these things because like everyone would refer to them as patrons and it's like, yeah, they are patrons, but I wanted them to be more than that. They're more than just a warlock patron. It is an actual thing that you don't even need a warlock in your party to put this in your world. And so I was trying to figure out what to call these, this category of entities because they're not gods, but they're more than just monsters. And so I was looking for something, something that was all powerful but risen above what ordinary things were. So all risen kind of came out as the term of art that I figured out would work for them. And so an all risen, for those of you who are interested, is functionally anything that's less powerful than a god, but could still fight a god and probably hold its own pretty well. It's, it's that tier of power between the highest of mortals and the lowest of deities. And so if you're looking at things like um, Archfiends or any sort of like lesser deity, they could probably be considered an all-risen if it's not explicitly divine. That's awesome. And so once I've got that figured out, I just kind of started going through them and seeing different ways that I can tie them together, different ways that I can make them individually interesting. and. I'd like to think that I succeeded in that. We now have 17 of these things, each with their own set of themes and lore, and big old pile of spells to go with them, subclasses to go with them, magical items. It's a grand time. It is a fantastic amount of content. I mean, there's not only the Warlock patrons and the various subclasses, there's also a plethora of familiars, new spells, invocations, feats. Uh, you're getting a lot when you buy the book, and I'm a big fan of some of your invocations, actually. <laughs> oh, really? That's great. Yeah, uh, my favorite one is the Shaped Blast, uh, the one that lets you turn your Eldritch Blast into like a cone or a radius and various other shapes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are very fun. So I have to ask, what's your favorite patron? Well, uh, I mean, I'm a big fan of the Accursed Archive. Uh, the way that you can manifest it anywhere makes for really cool roleplay, and the threat of the monster lurking in the library halls is really interesting to me as a player. Well, good. That's, I'm glad to hear it. I think that's one of the most popular ones, and so I'm really glad that I gave it an AA name and stuck it at the very front. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it makes sense to me because you've got this really interesting class that's not like anything you've usually seen before, and it really sets you up well for everything else that's coming. Well, good. I'm going to have to see if I can replicate that somehow with uh, Sacred Mysteries. It's going to be a wild time. Hopefully, yeah. And uh, the Great Portrait's another really interesting one. Uh, just having like the Dorian Gray style mechanics mixed in there is really interesting. Yes, the original tale of Dorian Gray was something that kind of stuck with me. I I've always had an affinity for warlocks, and I think that Dorian Gray, in a sense, was one of the first warlocks in my mind, not necessarily with that term, but that person who is under this really particularly strange situation, not necessarily because of something that he did in and of himself, but because of how his life just kind of worked out and the things that he did. And so seeing that 
in a new light was really important to me. The idea of someone not necessarily being in control of themselves and when they see the actual results of their work, that's that's a really big deal, both in like an artistic perspective of this is something that I've poured my life into and I have made this my own. But from a from a role playing and story perspective of look at all the horrible things that you've been interacting with and how stained your soul is and or has become and what the kind of consequences of that are in like a very visual sense. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the strongest parts of the book is that it offers a lot of interesting approaches to the warlock and the other classes in ways that I certainly wouldn't have thought about before. And it's that kind of innovation that I love about homebrew because I'm always being shown new ways of doing things that I just wouldn't have considered otherwise. Well, thank you. You're very welcome. But getting back to the book, so, I mean, I'm curious how the non-warlock classes came about. Did they just naturally evolve out of the all risen designs? So one of the very first things I was considering when I had just done, um, I had just done Sacred Mysteries for the first time and did Clerics with that, and it turned out all right. And then I tried to move to Druid. And I struggled with druids the first time. It was it was a real battle to try and get some new mechanics out that I liked. The it wasn't necessarily changes, but like new versions of existing subclasses were just not coming out the way I wanted to. And so I got kind of frustrated and I was like, okay, I'm gonna go back to something that I'm good at that I know I like, but I'm gonna do something new with it. And so I went and I was looking at the Ashen Wolf and I was like, this thing is really cool. What if we did a sorcerer? There's no good fire sorcerer. That's just the fire sorcerer. And so I made an Ashen Wolf lineage, uh, lineage a sorcerer bolt line. And I was like, okay, someone who has been corrupted by the Ashen Wolf, they've got their skin all charred and they're like practically a fire Ganassi or Genesi, however you say it. And they have a, co- a child. What is that child going to look like? What abilities are they going to have as a consequence of the deal that their parent made? And so I started looking at that and I was like, this is really cool. This is a great idea because now not only do you have all these warlocks, you have the sorcerers who are the children of the warlocks. But I realized that that necessarily wasn't fitting for all of them or it, it was kind of a limited in a sense. And so I was like, okay, you know what? Instead, I'm going to not only do a couple of sorcerers, but I'm going to do something for every class, except for, uh, except druids and clerics, because druids and clerics are getting their own book. So, <laughs> I'm definitely excited to uh, talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but for now, I'm curious, why did you choose the particular non-warlock classes that you did f- when you related them to the different patrons? Uh, some of those choices seem interesting to me the first thing that i kind of wanted to do was um stuff like the accursed archive everyone's like you should make a wizard based on this when i realized what i was doing and i was like no i'm gonna make a barbarian because that's the exact opposite of what you expect and everyone was like whoa <laughs> what have you done and um things like the shadow cat everyone's like you should make a shadow cat that's a rogue and i was like no barbarian and people loved the result, the uh, Path of the Mercurial. I call it the Cheshire Barbarian, affectionately, because the entire idea is that your rage isn't just rage. It's this big manic grin plastered across your face with all this kind of shadowy essence pouring off out of you. And the the entire idea of the Cheshire Cat made into a barbarian subclass is something that I think a lot of people really weren't expecting but ended up liking a lot. Because the entire one of the big big themes of Alice in Wonderland is madness, and um, are you, are you going crazy? Are you going mad by being here? And to take that and to put that onto the barbarian, the class that's all about being rage and angry, and mad and insane, was something that I feel like spoke to a lot of people in a way they didn't really expect. And so that's where we get Cheshire Barbarian. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just being able to draw that parallel between the idea of the 
barbarian rage and a kind of state of mania it being like uh, an extreme of happiness rather than anger is an interesting uh, parallel and it calls back to what you were saying earlier about drawing inspiration from the kind of work and materials that you're really interested in exactly if you like something in fiction find a way to put it into what you're making because if you like it somebody else likes it they'll appreciate it so have you ever gotten into a situation where you had two things that just didn't mix um let's see it kind of really depends when it comes to strange combinations i think that sometimes you can easily do stuff that's um, too specific too obscure uh or people will get it and they will not necessarily be satisfied because the thing that they like the obvious thing that they wanted is really what they wanted but it also gives you the opportunity to really deliver on it. so when i made that accursed archive barbarian there were a lot of people who were like why didn't you make a wizard and i was like i wanted to make a barbarian and they're like okay sure but now I'm coming back and I have created the Forbidden Lore Arcane Tradition, which is effectively the Accursed Archive, the wizard, but with even more spook going on. And everybody loved it. And we're like, yeah, this is awesome. This is what we wanted all along. And I was like, OK, cool. Well, now you have it. But <laughs> it's, it's one of those kinds of things where you have to write for yourself as much as you write for your audience. In fact, you have to write more for yourself than for your audience, because if you're having fun and you're enjoying what you're making, then you're going to be able to keep doing it. And if you're not enjoying it as much because you're trying to please everyone, then you're going to burn out and that's not fun for anybody. And then no one has any more content. So always write for yourself. First and foremost, you're going to have a good time and you're going to be able to make something that you're proud of and that you appreciate. Even if the world doesn't necessarily see it the same way, that's their fault. <laughs> yeah, and it doesn't hurt to play to the audience every once in a while. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that's that's how you that's how you get all the all the happy good uh, serotonin buttons when everyone goes, "Oh, I like it," and you're like, "Yes, thank you. Please <laughs> give more." Yeah, man, got to service those fans. Yes, yes. So, moving on from the classes. You have a great variety of familiars, each with their own flavor and special abilities. I mean, they're some of my favorite content in the book, but I'm curious if they came to you sort of naturally as part of each patron or were they developed separately and then kind of integrated? Uh, it, it's a little bit of mix and match. Um, so for a lot of them, it was pretty much like, hey, this is the obvious kind of thing and it's gonna work out great. Um, for example, the Ashen Wolf's little Emberborn fire dogs, like that's what you would expect. You're going to get a fire dog to go with the bub giant fire wolf thing, or uh, the harrowing hawk for the wild huntsman. Like, yes, you're obviously going to get a bird of prey to go with your hunter kind of character. It it all should line up and work out the way people expect. Um, but for other things, sometimes there's not really an obvious answer. So for the Eternal Citadel, you end up getting an animate shield as a familiar, and so simply because there's there's not really an obvious um, there's not an obvious answer because it's a building like what kind of what kind of thing are you going to get out of a well you can get something that speaks to the same themes of preservation and defense and durability and light and so if you have this little flying shield buddy that protects you lines up perfectly you know what I don't know why, but my mind immediately went to some kind of divine brick. <laughs> <laughs> Even better, have your pet rock. Yeah. <laughs> Should have um, done that. Oh well. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I'm a I'm a big fan of the shadow cat as well. It's really cute, and uh, the record keeper as well. The idea of like a, a living origami is just fantastic. Oh yeah, that that one was fun. Um, when I was writing that and I was uh, getting into the lore of how they all work and what they do, um, I was like, okay, what this thing's really cute. What's the most gruesome stuff I can have it do? Let's see. Um, it rips itself apart to put itself into a book. <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant. I mean, they all have some really cool abilities. Um, and the, the Scrivent Swarm as well is another really interesting one. 
Oh yeah, yeah. So originally, the original art of the uh, Warrior Saint had a more um, Egyptian feel to it, and I wanted to kind of go back to that in the familiar, and that was when I did the Scrubby and Swarm in the first place. And so here, I wanted to return to that aesthetic and say, hey, just because this particular depiction that I have in the book is how it is doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only um, cultural tone that you can put onto a particular thing. I really love hearing stories from people when they say like, Oh, I, uh, I completely redid your patron. I made it from this giant Kraken thing into like this sentient pulsing heart that is at the bottom of the ocean. And they like drills things in from above and kind of speaks to them in their dreams. I'm like, okay, perfect. You've done exactly what I wanted you to do, which was be inspired and make it your own. That's the whole reason I wrote it to be so open-ended is so that you'll take it and change it and make it what you want. I love that. I love that kind of thing. Yeah, and I think that definitely comes through. The uh, the opportunity to expand, I mean. Like, um, each patron has all of these threads that act as prompts for you, the DM, to come in and pick up where you, the author, left off. It really embodies that modularity you were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I was absolutely the intent, and I'm glad that it came through. And I have to ask, what is the deal with the wealth mimic? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the wealth mimic. Um, so the Blackthorn Grove and the Currency Conspiracy were the two patrons that were new to the hardcover. And I was writing them. And I got to trying to figure out what I was going to do with the currency conspiracy because I knew I wanted to write a wealth-based um, patron. I wanted to write something that was just like, hey, it's money. And I was trying to figure out how can you how can you make that actually work? How can you make that cool? And I was like, all right, let's have a conspiracy. And all of the weird bullshit conspiracy theories that everybody always has that may or may not be true, but we as a society just don't really care either way. <laughs> are going to be true for this. So all your money is just a fabrication by the elites to control you. And, oh, by the way, let's make it one step worse. The money is actually mimics. And when it wakes up, it's going to eat you alive and send your soul essence to the, the elite people in charge. And they're going to ascend to godhood after consuming the entire planet. And so it's like all of the all of the positives and negatives of wealth and capitalism in our existence taken to an extreme and then given this horrible twist at the end that just makes you go, oh, so it's actually all bad. Great. <laughs> Currency conspiracy, <laughs> the wealth mimic. And Julie Dun Jana did an absolutely beautiful job illustrating this thing with its big old goofy teeth and its big old goofy eyes like eh. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's so um, great. <laughs> yeah i mean it's definitely one of the best illustrations uh but yeah next i mean i'd love to talk more on the spells and invocations uh they take up a good chunk of the book and i have to know how you broached such a large collection i think that a lot of it was based on objectives uh, my my spell writing process was pretty deliberate there were a lot of things that i really wanted to do and to explore and the spell system is fantastic for that kind of thing where I don't really know uh, this, this, I don't want this to be a magic item. I want people to actually like have a consistent access to this. Uh, it didn't really fit as a class feature because it's kind of big or it's kind of complicated or it's a little niche and it should be available to more than just the one class or the one subclass that I'm putting it on. So with spells, I kind of worked through and tried to do all the things that I felt warlocks needed. Or when I was writing um, the subclasses, there would be blank spots where with warlocks, there's this a really irritating thing from a design perspective where they have a list of potential spells that they can learn that aren't warlock spells. So like bonus ones that you can pick from, but they have to be from a different class which means that if you have a blank spot because you only have so many spells available to you and there's not one for the theme that you need, you can go, oh, well, I have this blank spot. Now that means I have to write a new spell for a different class 
and then give it back to this particular warlock. That gives you uh, that that kind of created a lot of gaps for me, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna make some damage spells here. I'm gonna make some utility spells and that kind of thing to fill in each particular gap wherever it appeared, and then give it to the other classes as was required. But for certain things, um, there were some concepts that I really wanted to explore. Uh, for example, um, spells like Black Lotus Assault and Fell Onslaught. Uh, these are spells that work with melee weapons. They're combo attack spells. The entire idea is that after you cast it, you're going to be continuing to either make special attacks or your attacks are going to be empowered for a number of specific attacks, or you're going to have some kind of other effect that's going to encourage you to engage in weapon-based combat despite being a spellcaster. And I think that that's something that's like was missing in the original Warlock because we had the Pact of the Blade, but it wasn't really that supported because they didn't have any incentive to include it in their spellcasting. Warlock was a spellcaster first and foremost. They have Eldritch Blast, which is like the best cantrip in the game for damage purposes. And so for their weapon combat to mean something, the best way to do that is to say, hey, here's this really cool badass spell that you can use that only works with weapons. Now you have a cool weapon. Now you can use this cool spell even better than normally. Perfect. Yeah, and you asked for the prayers of everyone who wanted steel wind strike. Oh yes, yes, because they were like, "Oh, I just want that." No, you can have even wilder stuff. <laughs> yeah, and um, well, maybe you can clear this up for me because I've never really been sure exactly what role the warlock is meant to fill. I mean, it's already so versatile and it covers so many bases. It's just never been clear to me. Yes. Uh, they're they're kind of deceptive. So warlocks, despite having spells and are spellcast, but they're built from a mechanical perspective like a fighter. They are functionally a martial class. Their stuff comes back on short rests. They have a powerful attacking cantrip that allows them to consistently deal damage at will. They don't really have a lot of staying power in a fight beyond that initial burst of a couple of spells. And so you end up with these situations where you're only going to have two spell slots for the majority of your playtime, which means that if you're using both of them, then you're kind of out of luck until you take a rest. And so it gets into these sorts of situations where you're trying to pick stuff that's going to be really efficient. You don't have spells prepared. You have spells known, which means you have to be really deliberate about what kind of stuff you're picking. And so it gets into these situations where... If I'm going to be a warlock and I'm going to pick a spell, it's a lot more entertaining to choose a spell that's going to give me something to do through fight, which is why I've made combo attack spells for them, because that gives you like three or four turns of like, here's the cool thing that I'm doing, and it's all in the same spell slot. Sweet. That means that I have something entertaining to do the entire time instead of casting Hex and then blasting away with Eldritch Blast and... Like it's the same amount of spell slot usage and it's similar amounts of damage, but on one hand you're getting cool stuff, and on the other hand you're just doing the same thing. Which I know that that's what marshals do, but with marshals it feels better if that makes sense. For sure, and it I mean it, for me it feels like it can be quite difficult to innovate with the warlock just because their official content is so thinly spread. It takes effort. It definitely takes effort. The um, a lot of what it is really for me was, like I said, when you when you're forced to make new spells because you don't have access to all of the spells in Xanathar's or in the player's handbook even because you're using the open game license, which means you can only use a certain like subset of spells, which are like the OGL traditional spells that they allow you to use, and so when you're missing all of that content. There's a lot more gaps and that gaps give you opportunity to say, okay, I need a lightning spell at third level right here. And I don't want lightning bolt and I don't want call lightning. I want something new. And that gives you the opportunity to put something new there. And then you get really cool stuff. That's interesting. Cause I mean, I never would have considered that kind of additive design, but Moving on to the invocations, uh, did you find them easier or harder to write than the spells? 
Oh, much, much easier, especially when you do like I did and make them patron specific. Uh, that was one of the ways that I was able to make so many is that I made them patron specific and had them all function in different ways. And so when you do patron specific invocations, you end up with the ability to say, hey, here's all the core stuff that every warlock of this patron is going to get. And then you take the invocations and say, here's the optional stuff that's going to fill in specific play styles. You're going to give them unique stuff for the Pact of the Blade, Pact of the Chain, Pact of the Tome. You're going to give them unique options that wouldn't necessarily be available in the core class, but at the same time are tying to those abilities. Or for the general invocations, you say, look, my Pact of the Chain familiar, I want it to be able to fight in combat. How can I make it able to do that? Well, if you give it some invocations, if you create new ones that will allow it to have more hit points, give it the ability to attack better or do more damage, have kind of a suicidal explosion sort of thing, it gives it a lot more to work with that people are willing to take. Because while Warlocks do have a limited number of invocations, a lot of times when people are playing Warlocks, they really want to specialize. They want to be really good at one particular thing. And so if you give them the tools to build so that they can do that, they're going to be happy. They're going to be real happy campers. Yeah, and I think the Servants of the Master invocation is a really good example of that, like changing the meta of how your character works by empowering your pet. But uh, do you find it tough to keep up with Wizards of the Coasts and like the little changes they make to the class as time goes on? I think they recently introduced the new Star Chain Pact, for example. Oh, no, they they did. It was a while back, but I part of the reason that I didn't go in those specific directions and add new packs or add um, content for that sort of thing is, one, I either can't reference it because it's not system SRD OGL, or two, um, it takes more DM buy-in. It, it takes more group buy-in. And so... Uh, one of one of the things that people frequently ask me was, you're going to write all this stuff for Warlock. Why don't you just revise Warlock? You can do that. And I had considered it at one point, but I realized that it's just not worth it. There's so many ways that you can make new stuff to augment existing classes or to create options that will allow people to fulfill the desires that they have for a specific thing without changing the original content. Because when you say, oh, I want to play this, and people go, oh, that looks kind of cool, sure. But when you say, oh, I want to play this, but also I want to play a revised version of the original Warlock, and I want to add in all these extra spells, and it works like this instead, people are going to go, uh, what are you talking about? That, that, I mean, that's a whole lot of stuff that you're asking for. I don't know if it's legit. I don't know how well it's balanced. There, you're, just, you're just getting at a lot of trust issues and fewer people are going to want to use it. And then you got to say, okay, well, if you want to use this book, then you have to get the whole buy-in on the whole revision and then it becomes a mess and that reduces my lifespan and I ain't got time for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then, I mean, I'm curious if you've heard of sword Mail sorcerer, I think he did something kind of along those lines. Oh, sword Mail sorcerer is great. Uh, that's, that's quick, easy, small revisions. I think they're fine. Um, the uh, the warlock has larger fundamental problems in my eyes than the uh, sorcerer did, and so uh, one of the one of the biggest things that sword did that I liked was uh, origin spells for sorcerers. So like, hey, here's an extra list of spells that you just know that are tied to the theme of your subclass, and I'm like, hey, this is perfect, and you don't even need to have a revision to have these. You just put them in, and it takes like zero budget to do it because like it's not really that powerful. It's just flavorful. Here you go. Take it, use it. Done. It's great. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense that sorcerer only requires smaller changes and the warlock would require something a lot more substantive. But um, I suppose then how would you feel about going back and making revisions if Wizards of the Coast did make some grand sweeping changes uh, very, very unlikely. It would have to be really significant, and I would have to really love it in order to kind of go back. Um, one of the reasons for that is that um, 
once I pushed out the absolute final version of the compendium, I called it good. And a lot of the reason for that is the same reason that you're not going to get a whole lot of erratas in the player's handbook or anything like that, even for balanced stuff. It's simply because like continuity of the content. It needs to be able to be universally discussable. People need to be able to say, oh, this is cool. It's out. It's done. It's not being updated anymore, which means that it's at a consistent level that everyone should be able to be happy with it. Um, if they were to push out a new Warlock Pact that gave you like a new item of some sort, and they also made it SRD, I might consider releasing like a little one-page supplement somewhere that would give you some new content for that. But beyond that, unlikely. That's fair enough. But then how do you feel about um, like these living PDFs that seem to be cropping up now? Like the idea of not going to print for say like a year or two after you've published your PDF online and just spending that time making errata changes and bug fixes or um, like gameplay changes based on feedback, that kind of thing. It really depends. Um, personally, I wouldn't do that myself. When I was doing the release of the compendium for the first time in uh, I did a digital release first that had updates for a period of about a month and a half. And then I realized that I had gotten just about everything that I wanted to be changed. Like it was all where it needed to be. And I was going to call it good, called it good, went to the hardcover, done. Haven't touched it since beyond like the one very final update, just to make sure that some certain key stuff was taken care of. and. The whole purpose of that was to make sure that there was consistency and that everyone was going to have the same experience from it. If something's messed up, then at some point we can all just agree like, hey, mess that particular thing up. And I get why Wizards does that as well. A lot of people complain about Hexblade. I complain about Hexblade. But like, if they kept changing it all the time, no one would ever be happy with it. You're never going to have everybody happy. And so if you can have enough people be okay with something, good enough. That's just how it has to be when you're doing public content creation. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's probably even more pertinent for homebrewers because we work on so many projects and eventually you do just have to say that, yeah, this is finished now. Like I'm done. <laughs> you need to get it out there and move on so that you can improve. Otherwise, you'll just be sat there forever. Exactly. Uh, there, there comes a point where you have to say, this is good enough. We're done. Stop. Otherwise, you'll drive yourself crazy and work on it forever. Yeah, 100%. But to bring it back to the book for a second. So with the spells, I noticed that you've got some druid and cleric ones in there. And you mentioned that you're working on a new book just especially for them. Do you think that there'll be any overlap with the spells that you placed in this book? Uh, these specifically cater to the themes in this book, but um, in Sacred Mysteries, which will be the next book, which is Clerk and Shruit themed, there will be some reprinted spells. Um, and the reason for that is just uh, ease of reference. Like I'm not going to reference a spell that's not in the book in the book when it's not like player's handbook official content because how Wizards tries to do their books is um, Player's Handbook plus one. So if you have the Player's Handbook and whatever other thing, you're good. With me, I try and tr do the same thing, as in you need the Player's Handbook and my book, and that's all you need. You don't even need the Player's Handbook even. You just need the system reference document, which is free, but, you know, functionally Player's Handbook. <laughs> yeah, we can definitely strive to be better. Yeah, we, we can strive to be better. Just uh, take the take the same stuff, put it in the new one. That way people can flip to the back of the book and can go, ooh, instead of having to go, oh, it's in cough, so I got to go get the PDF, or I got to go get my book out. And it's a pain. And uh, this is probably a good opportunity for us to talk more about your self-publishing. Uh, for those of you who don't know, you can get the Compendium of Forgotten Secrets as a fully printed hardback book. Uh, it's easily on par with anything Wizards of the Coast put out, and very impressive. 
Uh, but I'm curious, what took you down the path of self-publishing? Um, we talked about DMs Guild earlier, and I was pretty much like, eh, not doing that. So then I looked at other options, and Open Game License was the one that worked. And I was like, okay, we're going to go to that. And then I started looking at seeing how I could uh, make it work. And uh, self-publishing was the most straightforward answer in our modern times. There are several fantastic services that you can use, and you just say, hi, here's my book. Please print X number of copies. And, or, hey, hi, here's my book. Please put it into your files, and then whenever anyone orders it with this ISBN number uh, off Amazon, then uh, you print a copy and send it to them. And I take my cut, and you take your cut. We're good. And it's great. It's absolutely great. Okay. I mean, I never would have thought it was that easy. Oh, it's exceptionally easy. From what I understand, back in the day, you had to go and you had to find a publishing house. And say, oh, we're going to do a run of 10,000 copies. It better be good. And we're like, hmm. And so now, it, these days, you can get as few as like 50 copies printed of your whatever it is that you've made for not even a big deal. And it's it's fantastic, sincerely fantastic. So does that mean that you had to get like 50 books printed in advance in order for you to be able to have stock to sell? Oh, no, that was that was all optional. I just wanted to do uh, sign hardcovers because it makes me happy. And so. Uh, I did a pre-order period and uh, I think I sold close to a couple hundred during that first pre-order period and got them all in, had a big little signing party, sat there and wore my hand out, sent them out to everybody. And that was all completely independent of the Amazon sales and uh, Barnes and Noble and that kind of thing. You could have it just automatically send out in print. Uh, Ingram Spark does it. Amazon even has their own service, though I wouldn't personally recommend it if you're doing um, the D and D style hardcovers because they don't necessarily have the same um, like printing size options available. But it's wild. Yeah, and I mean, I'm sure that it's the dream of most homebrewers to be able to hold a physical version of their book in their hand someday. Yeah, it's very satisfying, I will admit. So then what advice would you have for anyone who's interested in following your footsteps and going down the path of physical publishing? Um, if you want to make money, don't do this. Or rather, I like, if you want to make money, don't do this. <laughs> if you want to have a fun hobby that you can feel satisfied about, do this. Um, if you're gonna get your own personal custom art, because that's what you have to do in order to do any kind of legitimate publishing, uh, expect to have a lot of time. Art takes time. It's very important. Make sure you find good artists that you like. Treat them well. Please treat your artists well. Uh, I, I hear so many terrible stories of, like, artists not getting paid well or not getting paid at all, please treat your artists well. They're good people. They're making beautiful things for you. Be nice to them. <laughs> yeah. Um, as someone whose players are all professional artists, I can attest to that they're never going to touch anything involving the word exposure. And if you really are serious about getting art commissioned, uh, you should easily be expecting to pay something in the triple digits, which is really the starting price for the, this kind of work, but absolutely worth every penny you pay. <laughs> yes, definitely that. Uh, the, um, the other thing I would say is make sure you get an audience before you try and publish something. Uh, it, this, this may seem kind of like counterintuitive, but giving stuff away for free is how you make money these days. It, th this is this is going to seem super counterintuitive, but when you give stuff away for free, people go, "Ooh, hey, I like that guy. That guy is cool." 
And if you just keep giving them good stuff, eventually the guilt will overcome them and they'll say, man, you know, I'll just buy it. Why not? This, this, <laughs> this person is making really cool things and I really like it. And I'm going to, I'm going to get it for myself and I'm going to get it to support this individual. And people feel really good knowing that they could do that. But if you don't give it away for free, you're not going to get much of an audience because people are going to go, oh, who's that guy? Oh. Yeah, the DMs Guild is a really good example of that. It is, and it's really difficult for a lot of people who are getting started out in that kind of area because if you're not a name, and like um, well, when I say that, I mean like if you're not if you're not someone who people recognize, then you're going to struggle. And the only way you can get recognized is if you make stuff and people see it. And so getting that audience is huge, especially to start. Yeah, absolutely, and. For anyone who has trouble really getting to terms with it, think of it more as investing in your fan base. Exactly. And especially with digital d distribution. Like, So within a month of me releasing the full edition of the Compendium, it was up on piracy sites, and I knew it. And I thought to myself, that's fine, because I'm already giving it away for free. And, you know, whatever. It's one of those things where you just kind of have to accept it in... The fact that, sure, a lot of people aren't necessarily going to do right and buy it after they've read it or used it or whatever. But if you're already giving away the majority of it for free, then the people who are going to spend money are the people who want to support you, the people who like what you've made and actually want to pay for it. Because you can find anything on the Internet these days. It's easy. It takes like five minutes and any product that's digital, you can get it off the Internet for free. Not legally, but for free. And so if you can make something and you can give it out to everybody because they're going to get it anyway because they hired it if they want to, if you can get something and give it out to people, then you can say, hey, I made something. I'm voluntarily giving it away. I'm a good person. Please buy my stuff. And they'll go, okay, sure. And that's great. Yeah, and that's what worked for me with the uh, compendium as well is you had the free version there. Um, I got a taste for the content. I knew that I liked what I saw and I wanted more. Like <laughs> there was more available, so I went for it. Gotta gotta get people with that uh that that freemium freemium lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um well, I mean I think some of the last advice we could probably give is on the subject of commissioning artists. Uh you mentioned it a little bit earlier. Uh, it might be helpful for people to have some insight into what your process is for commissioning artwork. Uh, artwork is uh, pretty straightforward. I uh, went on places like DeviantArt and ArtStation and Twitter. There's a massive communities of artists on Twitter. And you look around, you find people whose styles you like. Uh, you find people whose portfolios fit the kind of content that you're looking for and the styles that you like. It's a huge thing. And then you send a message, say, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm doing this thing, and I would like to commission you to do whatever this thing is, and here's my budget for this particular piece. Are you open for commission, or are you interested in what I'm asking for? And they'll tell you yes or no. And if they tell you no, all right, cool. Or if they say that they charge more for it, all right, cool. Sorry. Uh, but a lot of times you'll be able to find people who are willing to do what you want within the budget that you have. And you can say, fantastic, but obviously don't lowball them. You get what you pay for. But I have a giant collection of fantastic artists. Well, maybe not giant is the word, but a extremely high quality collection of fantastic artists <laughs> that do such amazing work. They're sincerely fantastic. All the folks in the compendium are glorious. And even beyond that, uh, I have I have some new artists who are coming in for uh, Sacred Mysteries. And man, they do some stuff that's just exceptional. I, I cannot imagine how much hard work it took to become that good because they're doing it. It's incredible. Yeah, it really is that easy. It really is that easy. If you give people money, they do what they're good at. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So uh, last but not least, uh, future projects. You've mentioned the compendium of sacred mysteries uh, a little bit earlier. Yes. So the next book is the compendium of sacred mysteries resurrection. It is a uh, similar to the compendium of forgotten secrets. It focuses on uh, faith and nature, and it has classes or i'm sorry there's a new class the warden class which is produced by vorpal dice good friend of mine uh and it has over 50 new subclasses many for cleric a lot more for druid and a lot more for everything else and so it's gonna have spells and it's gonna have a lot of really interesting lore i think people are gonna really appreciate it focuses on um, the idea of how faith in a world where divines are fact is really different and interesting and how people can kind of take that in for their characters. A lot of times what I'll see in my own role-playing experiences is that unless somebody's playing a cleric or maybe a paladin, they don't really have a whole lot to do with gods and deities, but like imagine if your deity was so present as to be like the leader of your country, like, Oh yeah. You know, today, uh, president, uh, all strict the divines at, uh, that, uh, you, you need to make sure that you're doing your daily penances or whatever. It becomes a really big deal for people. It'd be like if it'd be like if the Pope was just like, hey, we're doing this today. And you're back in the times when the Pope was like the number one force in all of the European world. That kind of thing is huge. And so for religion to not be a bigger deal for characters in role playing games is a little, little curious to me. But at the same time, I totally understand it. Our modern proclivities haven't necessarily pushed religion to the forefront. But at the same time, it's one of those interesting things where dealing with NPCs and kind of factions and various things like that, it'll get you into a whole lot of interesting situations. But unfortunately, I am out of time. So I have to get a shirt here, I'm afraid. Not a problem. We're right at the end anyways. Uh, thank you very much for spending your time with us and sharing all of this interesting history about uh, your work. Uh, definitely looking forward to seeing what else comes up and maybe we can talk again once Sacred Mysteries is out. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. See you later. Thanks again to Genuine Fantasy Press for joining us. And if you're interested in checking out the Compendium of Forgotten Secrets or you just want to join the GFP Discord, head over to genfantasypress.com. There's a link in the description. And of course, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of Brewmasters, then be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you don't miss the next episode when we talk to Sword Meow about his success on Patreon with Meow Magic. Until the next adventure, stay safe.